Welcome, everybody. My name is Bill Schneider. I'm president of the John Shaw Billings History of Medicine Society, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here for this, our next to last talk on the history of medicine for this academic year. We're delighted to that the Regan Street Institute has uh, agreed to host us, given our choice of speakers. It's obviously natural, as many of you know, or you'll soon find out. Uh, the John Shaw Billings History of Medicine Society is actually quite old. It goes back to the 1960s and was established to promote the uh, research and teaching of the history of medicine. Uh, from the beginning, we have worked with the Library of Medicine, Medical Library here at the medical school, and we've, uh, we're active in a number of things, including esta helping establish the uh, Medical History, Indiana Medical History Museum, and um, the, uh, uh, the, the talks, though, uh, that were given. Uh, also, recently in the curriculum, there's some history of medicine electives that the med students uh, can have. And, um, but the longest uh, service that we've done have been talks like this. Um, uh, we've been, had co-sponsors in addition to the medical library with the medical humanities and health studies program here on campus. And about 10 years ago or so, a uh, medical student uh, history of medicine interest group which uh, was started and functioned pretty well. And uh, they decided to have a watch party over at the medical library. So I don't think there's any med students here, but if you are here and want to know more about history of medicine, let me know. Or if you're watching online, uh, we can give you information about how to get in touch with Alex Nelson, who's the head of the uh, medical student uh, history uh, interest group. Uh, as I said, the uh, talk today is the next to last talk. Uh, we have one more talk. Uh, it's going to be in a couple of weeks that uh, I can tell you about. It's really sponsored by the IU Center for Bioethics, and it's their annual uh, silver lecture on the Holocaust, genocide, and contemporary bioethics. And the speaker in two weeks will be Alex Kaur. If the name sounds familiar to you, he's the son of um, Ava Kaur, uh, who himself is a, a doctor, and he's going to be talking on lessons of the Holocaust for healthcare personnel. And that'll be Monday, April 17th at 6 p.m. Uh, at the Campus Center uh, here. Uh, you can get information about it by going to the Bioethics Center or the Medical Library or the John Joe Billings. So the topic for today is a uh, much less dramatic, uh, more mundane subject of medical records, but it's one that touches everybody, healthcare providers, patients, past, present, and future. It's a pretty good subject to understand the history of, because if there's one subject that historians and healthcare providers agree about, it's the importance of medical records. Uh, the speaker today is ideally uh, suited to give us uh, his perspective on the recent history of medical records and the shift from uh, per paper to electronic records. Bill Tierney, as most of you probably know, uh, is kind of a fixture here, both on campus and especially at Regan Street. Uh, He's currently a professor of global health uh, at the uh, Indiana University Fairbanks School of Public Health. He's also a senior researcher here at Regan Street and part-time professor in population health at the University of Texas, Austin Dell Medical School. Uh, he goes back to medical school here at the uh, Indianapolis uh, campus back in the 1970s, stayed around for his residency, and then joined the medical school early in 1980. Two of the uh, in, uh, places that he was early connected to, uh, the then city hospital, I guess it was called Wishard then, but now it's called Eskenazi Health, uh, and Regan Streif, uh, which he uh, started working with, he eventually rose to become uh, the chief of medicine at, w at Wishard and the president of Regan Streif here uh, from 19, uh, 2010 to 2015. Uh, he also, in between, was director of research at the IU AMPATH program in Kenya, where he also uh, was in charge of informatics and uh, electronic health record system there, which I'm sure we'll hear more about. Um, he went in 2015, he left for places not quite as remote as Kenya, but Texas, to become the founding uh, chair, I guess, of the Department of Population Health at the new medical school that was created at uh, Austin at the University of Texas campus and came back here in 2021 uh, to uh, work in the places that I mentioned. So uh, to sum up, I guess uh, we historians would call Bill Tierney a primary source 
on the history of medical records. And so without further ado, Bill. Well, thanks, Bill. Thanks um, for those of you who are braving the weather to be here and all the people who are uh, connected electronically. I mean, I am the last generation that actually started using only paper records. There were no electronic records at all when I started practicing medicine. Then the first ones were implemented when I was a house officer, and then I got involved on the other side of things. So this is really going to talk about that progression and kind of look towards the future. But paper to purgatory. I mean, purgatory is between heaven and hell, and you can go in either direction. And I guess the question is, which direction are going to be headed? Um, uh, I have no financial conflicts of interest. Um, and uh, first of all, I think about health care, and when we think about health care, we think it's a service business, right? That we go to a health care provider, uh, physicians and other clinicians, what do they deliver? They deliver information and advice, medication, devices, surgery, physical therapy. They do things for you and to you, and hopefully give you some comfort, hope, and, and better outcomes than if you hadn't gone there. Um, I'm going to, I will, yeah, I mean, if you don't go home with anything else today, health care is an information business. Because what we actually do, what clinicians actually do, is we find information. You know, if we think about a, a patient sitting in front of you, the first thing you do is you look at the records. What can I learn about this patient um, that he, maybe the patient doesn't know? What's in the record? We gather information by history and physical and labs and imaging studies and things like that. We process information. So we think, what does it mean? You know, what's the diagnosis? How should I treat it? You know, and then we make decisions, sometimes on our own, often hopefully with we, we shared decision making with the patient. And then we record information. We write notes, we write reports, stuff like that. And we then communicate information to others, to the, to the patient, to other providers, et cetera, information, advice, orders, letters, and things like that. Okay, so this is what we do. It's an information business. Yes, okay, surgeons operate, they cut on people, but they spend most of their time doing cognitive things, not cutting. They don't spend eight hours a day, you know, five days a week in the operating room. They often are not in the operating room deciding when to operate and following up the, the um, uh, post-operative stuff, okay? So the quality, efficiency, and effectiveness of care depends on our ability to manage information. So we, so we manage information as much as we man managing patients, managing information aren't different things. It's the same thing, okay? Um, now, like most medical studies, I'm going to start off with a case presentation that's illustrative, okay? And it starts with an 81-year-old man who, and I worked in the Wishard Emergency Department for 25 years. Somebody just arrives in an ambulance. Um, he's awake, confused, and the, and the ambulance people said he had a fall. They don't know anything else about him. Um, uh, there's no reliable information from the patient because he's confused and he's fallen. Um, there are no local records. He's never been to the hospital before. Um, nobody accompanied the patient in the ambulance. They have no idea what his living situation is. Physical examination showed him to be severe orthostatic hypotension when he stands up, his blood pressure drops. He has a non-focal neuro exam, doesn't look like he's had a stroke. Um, he's got a tremor that looks like he's got Parkinson's disease, and he's ataxic. He has trouble walking in a straight line, he's trouble, trouble standing without falling down, which might explain why he had a fall. Um, mental exam shows he's pleasant, conversant, Dementia may be mild, it's hard to tell. He's got an expressive aphasia. He can't get the words out, okay? Um, uh, he lives alone uh, with a caretaker after his wife's death. Um, they find this out because the caretaker calls in. Um, and the family lives out of state, and there's no contact information. They don't know how to get a hold of the family. Um, the lab tests, you know, so they examined the patient. It was non-focal. Um, they do lab tests. They found that it was normal, except he's got an elevated serum creatinine, which means he's got some chronic, maybe acute, hard to tell because in old records, he's got some kidney disease. Um, and then imaging, he has a CT scan of his head, shows he's got a small bleed in, in, um, in the area between his two cerebri. So, so um, and, and cerebral atrophy, chronic, happens with people with dementia. Um, or professors of global health. Um, and the neurosurgeon sees the patient and says, and says, don't know what's going on right now, but we're gonna hosp let's hospitalize him for, uh, for observation. Um, uh, and he's put in the ICU. The patient's in-home caregiver calls the patient's son and says, your father's in the hospital. Well, what happened? But he had a fall. Well, how's he doing? I don't know. And so the, the, the son calls in and he's told, your father's in intensive care. His condition is critical, and because I can't tell you anymore because of HIPAA. 
um, which actually is not true, but anyway. Um, the son is not allowed to speak to the doctors and he can't provide the name of the patient's, pri patient's primary care physician where records might exist, past history of his dementia. He's got this thing called multiple system atrophy, which some of you understand if you understand what that is. And he's got a history of prostate cancer. Medications his father taking, they can't tell him that. He can't tell, he can't, he can't tell them that the patient had a desire for no invasive treatments. Didn't want to be put on a ventilator, didn't want to be coded. Um, um, he had a prior reaction to Cinemet, a medicine is used for Parkinson's disease. He looked like he had Parkinson's disease. He didn't, he had multiple system atrophy, which has a Parkinsonian-like tremor. Um, and they gave him Cinemet, uh, methylopocarbidopa, it's used to treat Parkinson's disease, and he went berserk on it. Running around the neighborhood naked, and, uh, and so he was taken off it and, and uh, put on other things. So, so he's, the hospitalist writes admitting orders, and he writes an order for Cinemet because the patient has Parkinson's disease. Why? Because that's what was, what was written on the ER note. Um, the patient becomes agitated and delirious. They sedate him with lorazepam. He, has, he stops breathing on lorazepam and has a cardiopulmonary arrest. He's successfully resuscitated and he's placed on a ventilator. Um, the patient remains in the ICU, is in ICU and doesn't wake up after the event. Um, the neurosurgeon repeats the CT scan, repeats the exam and a CT scan the next day, doesn't look changed and he says, I don't know why he's not waking up, but it's not because of the bleed. It's probably because he had a cardiac arrest and he's got cerebral ischemia. Um, the family flies in from out of state and informs them that the patient did not want to be on a ventilator um, and makes arrangements for nursing home placement the patient wakes up and is able to come off the ventilator. And, and then they return home waiting for the outcome of treatment with some interaction with his in-home caregivers. Um, the patient remains in a coma. His breathing does improve and he's able to take off a ventilator and is transferred to the ward. The ward medicine service, they didn't provide him with contact information for the family so they can't contact the family to know what they want, et cetera. So they discharge the patient to a nursing home. Um, uh, the family is unaware of the patient's in a nursing home. And in the nursing home, the patient has another arrest and dies. Okay. Um, this is that patient, okay, and he was my dad. So what, what happened here? Let's, you know, so what, what, what was the failure here? There was no communication between the patient and outpatient care. Why? Because the PCP, the primary care provider, had paper chart, you know, and there was nobody there that night to fax the record over to the hospital, which would have been possible if somebody known that that was who the primary care physician was, which wasn't known either. Um, they did have electronic billing, but no electronic records. Um, and no way to communicate with other healthcare providers. So, the, so it's all these isolated places where people are cared for. There's no place, no way they can talk to each other except by telephone and fax. Um, the drug reaction had been recorded in the, in the primary care provider's notes, um, but it didn't follow the patient to the hospital. Um, and with no, no information resulted in poor fatal management. Nobody came to work that day to kill this patient. But, be, but did things that seemed reasonable at the time based on the information they had. They just didn't have the right information. So I'm, back to what I said before, healthcare is an information business and the quality, safety, and effectiveness of care and, and the cost of care depend on having the right information on the right person at the right time and place presented in the right way to make the right decisions. And those are the five rights of health information. And we should demand that both as providers and as patients. And many people in this room are providers. Everybody in this room is a patient. And if you're not lucky, you, you're going to be. Um, so, so U.S. healthcare, I'm going to argue, is kind of broken. I mean, if you've seen this curve before, right? That that the um, you know the cost of care is more than double what the other you know organization of economic cooperation and development OECD countries. There are 37 of them. They're all clustered over here. We're over here with, with double the cost of care per patient, averaging $12,000 a year. And our life expectancy, no matter what you measure, we're worse. And life expectancy is an easy one to, to count. And so we're, we're, we're worse in getting, we're worse than the others and getting worse than that. And for African-American males, it's even worse. And arguably, a lot of this has to do for the healthcare system that we created, especially my generation created. Um, Poor communication is a major culprit. We are all healthcare consumers. This is going to affect all of us. And you probably all have stories about how miscommunication has, has frustrated you, if not caused problems with, you, with your health. Um, we also all pay for this expensive care. 
we are the enemy. We've seen the enemy. The enemy is us. And so I think that we, as a group, especially a place like Regan Street and IU, should have feel some obligation to fix it. Um, we deserve better. Our patients deserve better. Um, communities deserve better, and we can do better. Okay. So, and I'm going to tell the story about how information can be a key aspect of the getting better, hopefully. So, electronic, you know, documentation of healthcare. Um, it goes way back. This is the first known medical record. It's from China 5,000 years ago, okay? Um, this is from Babylonia um, 2,500 years ago. So, so people documented stuff, but they're generally talking about medical care or care of populations, not about individuals. That really started happening um, in Western Europe and the United States back in the early uh, 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 20th century, you know, early 1900s. Before that, people just didn't document care. They just delivered care. Um, the same way that, you know, you go to Kinko's to get something copied, they, they have a billing record, but they don't, they don't have a lot of detail. What they did, at least, I guess they do now, but they didn't earlier. But people who deliver things to you, do things for you, they, you know, as, especially back in the pre-digital era, they didn't record all this stuff. They just did it, right? And the same thing with healthcare. You did stuff, but you didn't record it until the early 20th century when people decided they wanted to know what they were doing. Okay, so why do, but why document? Why should we document healthcare? Well, because the patient's gonna come back and I wanna know what I did and I wanna know what I was looking for. I wanna know what's wrong with the patient and how I'm treating that patient so I can follow up and see whether or not it's working and whether or not the treatment should be changed, right? Future visits to others. If they go to somebody else, if I document stuff and they get hold of those records, it might help with the care, such as the adverse drug event that my father had. Um, patient inquiries. The patient comes in and asks something, so you can go and look up what the, what the provider had written, what the clinician had written, right? And then, um, uh, and then be able to give that patient, answer that patient's questions. And research, both the little R research, how does a practice make their care better? And the big R research, how do the pointy headed academics like us make care better? Um, billing, you need, you know, of course you need, you document things so you can bill what you're treating, how long and how hard it was to treat it and what you had to use to treat it so you can get, you can get reimbursed for the care. Um, practice management, we document things so I, as if I'm running a practice, I know what my practice is doing. I can do what I can to make it more efficient and higher quality, et cetera. You can't do that if I don't, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you just finished the college basketball season. Yeah, you can get better if you don't know if your shot's going in or not. You can't make your practice better if you don't know what you're doing. It's, it's pretty simple and straightforward. So you can't have quality improvement, look for best practices. You also can't, can't document what's happening to be able to protect yourself from mal malpractice. Um, so, but, but that's all important. But for me, and this is the thing I tell medical students, is that when you sit down to write a note about the patient, it's the only time you comprehensively think about that patient that day, what's going on, and, and what I decided to do about it. I can't tell you the number of times that I'm, after I saw a patient, I was sitting there writing a note, and I went, ah, and I went out and I had to tell the patient something in the waiting room, because I had forgotten about it. It was the writing the note that made me put it all together and say, yeah, I want to do that too or not forgotten about it. I didn't even realize that I wanted to do it until I started getting my thoughts together while writing the note. Most notes you write, nobody will ever read. The importance is that by writing it, you understand what you're doing. It's a cognitive, uh, creative aspect that helps you understand that person and that care at that moment in time. Um, so before the digital era, this is what notes looked like. Does anybody know what the problem is at the top? Can you read that? Yeah, see, the, it's, most of it's the tinnitus, right? And it says, you know, that the, 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 the TMs, the ear canal TMs are clear, that Renee's and Weber's tests are negative. Again, I can't read what he's trying to do for him. But this was a note. This is what medical records look like. This is how I delivered care as an early house officer. We write notes like this. Um, uh, more often, we write notes like this. Okay, so this is a... Um, 
you know, this is a patient who's coming in who's, who's got a cardiac history, et cetera. And what physicians and other providers started doing was dictating notes because it's just too hard to write all this stuff down by hand. It takes too much time. And you just dictate it and you use transcription services. So in the, in the mid 19th, in the mid 20th century, in the mid 1900s, a lot of people had dictating services where they would dictate notes. Um, so these two things say the same thing. It's just that the number of characters in the bottom one is twice the one at the top because, because clinicians use a lot of shorthand that they understand that maybe few other people do, okay? And then their records look like this. This is actually a picture of the records in the clinic where I used to work. And it worked pretty well. I mean, we had our own records and they were there, except when they didn't, okay? Um, I'll tell you about that in a second. So this was, this was the paper-based system that was studied back in 1973 by the first Regan Streif fellow by the name of Joe Mamlin, which some of you may have heard of. Um, and he did this time motion study with, I mean, I'm going to go deep in the history of Regan Street, but Regan Street was established to be an industrial engineering health systems research uh, organization. And the first people here were from the industrial engineering department at Purdue. Um, and they did this time motion study that, I, that actually happened when I was in, in the particular clinic. Every time you walked in, you had, you had the thing you had to stamp. Anytime you go in and out of a door, you had to, you had to put the paper you were holding and get, to, get it stamped. And then people would hand enter that into a, um, actually into a paper spreadsheet to be able to do the analyses. And what they found was um, that, uh, that they, they, of the study of 103 physicians and 2,500 observations, that they spent about 38% of their time charting and charting meant either reading or writing in the, the paper chart, okay? Now, I'm going to fast forward to something that's coming later in the talk. People are bemoaning the fact that they spend 40% of your time in electronic health records. It ain't any different. It's just a different medium. But I think people felt more comfortable writing with a pen than typing on a keyboard. At least people in my generation. Don't get me started. Okay. In the 1960s, there was a guy named Larry Weed. How many people have heard of Larry Weed? And it's kind of sad that pe most people haven't, don't, don't know who Larry Weed was, because he, he, he did as much as anybody in, in changing the thinking about, about healthcare. He was the one that created what we call the SOAP note, okay, which is the standard subjective, objective, acceptance, assessment of plan, something, the same thing that most clinicians use every day on every patient to this day. He did this in the 1960s, okay? And he did it because he wanted to, not not because uh, it's it's he wrote an article saying you know, records that to care and teach in other words they teach you learn about your care that you're delivering because you you are carefully organizing your clinical thinking and and he wanted to create an organized way of thinking about every single encounter and he did this surreptitiously because he developed one of the first electronic medical record systems back in the city called Promise at the University of Vermont. Okay, didn't last long after him because it was just him. He didn't have the kind of support he needed. But, but the whole idea was he thought we could organize this stuff and we could computerize it. Um, and this book, every one of us medical students had to read when I was a medical student here in the 1970s. Required reading. So now, you know, in the paper era, paper's good, okay? It's cheap, okay? It's easier to use. You don't need a user manual for paper. Right? And it's portable and it's malleable. You can do anything you want with it. Right? But paper ain't so good. You know, it's easily corruptible. There was a there was a fire in the building that held the medical records and the um and the x-ray the actual x-ray films for Wishard Hospital back in the nineteen eighties and destroyed all the old records and all the old x-rays because the sprinkler system went on, even though the fire wasn't in that room. So we lost all our records. We literally lost all the, all the, all most of the records within within the Wisha Health System, at least the hospital system. It's difficult to see, secure. I can tell you that I can put a white coat on and walk in any hospital in this country. Walk up and pull a chart off and walk off with it. There's there's there, there's very little security for paper paper charts, and there's no there's there's no control over what's written. You can write anything you want in a chart, even if it's wrong. You can write stuff in a chart. Um, and it's often illegible. They used to say the only two required courses in medical school are how to write illegibly and how to make people wait. Um, and then it's expensive and cumbersome to store and retrieve. How do you search that for the last 
you know, uh, ex chest X-ray. Where do you? I mean, it's it's the the note from the cardiologist, or the, when it's all there, more or less chronologically, maybe. Um, it's difficult, and it bloats. The rooms get filled, and you can't take them away to someplace else because then they're not accessible. So this is what the Wishard work record room looked like. I used to go there occasionally to do research and pull records out, and it was it was a mess. And as you might guess, records got lost. Um, and so when I was in clinic and I had a patient, whether it's a new patient or old patient, this is what I often got. Blank sheet of paper, no chart. It's either in another clinic, it's in the billing or coding office, it's lost, or the patient hasn't been here before, but this is all I got. And so when we were, prim our, when we were practicing primary care, we kept three by five cards with all our primary care patients with their diagnosis, their name, their hospital number, their diagnosis, and their last treatments. And we just updated the cards and we filled the card, we got, got a new card, um, and we kept these things in our, in our black bags. And yes, we had black bags in those days because there wasn't any equipment on the walls of the clinics. You had to carry everything with yourself, by yourself. Um, this is what we had to do in, in a paper era so that we could know what's going on with our patient. But only us, no one else knew this information if the chart was lost. Um, and then along came Clem. Now, in the, in the early, in addition to the Promise system, there were people in, in Kaiser Permanente, uh, Maury Cullen, who was creating electronic records back in the late 60s. And then in the early 70s, the, their academic programs at Harvard, Utah, Columbia, Duke, um, UCSF, I guess, a few of the, uh, of the academic programs started developing electronic records. And when Sam Reagan Street, this, Sam Reagan Street, I'm not gonna go into the history, but he, he established this institute because he saw, he was a health systems, he was a systems engineer. And he saw that the health system was, was terribly broken and he wanted to create an institute to, make, to help fix it. And he, he first uh, brought in the industrial engineers from Purdue and they said, we need a computer guy. So they looked for a computer guy. Clem had was was from near around Chicago, but he had he'd gone to he got a degree in computer science from Notre Dame. He'd gone to University of Illinois Medical School. He did an internship at Harvard. And then he spent two years at NIH programming the first laboratory system at NIH. Then he came back in in uh, the, the 1970 to do finish a two year residency in Cook County Hospital, and Reagan Street hired him, and said, you know, you you um, we want you to come down and create electronic medical. A medical record system for our system so we can do we can use that information to improve care um, and this is what it looked like back then um, and and this is 1972 and by 1974 two years later he had created the Reagan Street medical record system he and two other people and I'll show their you show you their their picture in a second and it had these components the registration and scheduling system with ADT admission discharge transfer and it, it carried information on the, who the patient is stuff about the patient, birth, birthday, sex, race, building information, diagnosis, insurance, et cetera, appointments that are scheduled, appointments that are kept and for kept, where they are, when they were, and who saw them, okay? He also created a laboratory information system, and it's, it's more than laboratory because it stored not only clinical test results, but full text reading of, of or actually coding of imaging studies. We actually had coders in the Regan Street Institute who would, who would hand code the results of, of every X-ray done within the Wishard Health System. Um, vital signs, diagnoses, and other digitized data from the encounter form, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, then, the, then a pharmacy system, and it, it had information on the drugs dispensed, the name of the drug, the dosage form, the dose, patient instructions, the day supply given, and all the data necessary for the Wishard Pharmacy to run itself. Um, and then a database to store all this stuff in. And for each item in the database, there was a patient, a who, a date, a when, a dictionary term, a what, and then a value. And the value could be a number, could be a code, could be free text. And the code could be, could be a, uh, other, you know, other dictionary terms with multiple things in there. So, you know, you got hypertension medications with a beta, and beta blockers within that set. And within this set of beta blockers, there's atenolol. But, and atenolol is also used for tremors and things. I mean, there's, there's there are all sorts of ways that we group these, that they group these, this information so that it was easily understandable and retrievable by people with clinical knowledge. Um, but he didn't sit down and have people type on computers. And the reason was is that they were horribly expensive back then. There were no min microcomputers. They just had room-filled computers. They didn't have little computers to type on. He had terminals for those big computers, but they weren't 
graphical user interfaces. They were clunky. They were expensive. And, and he didn't want to get doctors using computers, so he used paper. Okay, but he used a structured form like this that some of you may have seen who have been around here for a little bit. But you know, up in the upper left was the, the, the diagnosis list, which comes from the, from the database, which comes from the ADT system. Okay? And the left lower, it's, it's where they can write in the vital signs. And then we had a group of data entry people hand enter these data into the computer database. So that information is available for searching. Um, there, were, there, was, there were check boxes for things that are appropriate for that patient. This is a pediatric patient. So were the things about growth and development that instead of having to write the stuff, you put, just put check boxes. And this information was again coded into this, uh, written in the hand entered into the system. And then had places where you could write your illegible notes. Okay. Um, um, in addition to your illegible orders and your illegible signature. Um, and then a copy of this form was sent to the hospital medical record and the original was kept in the clinic and a chart that went in that wall cabinet that you saw earlier. Okay. And then, but the innovative thing is here at the bottom. Okay. And this was the reminder system. You know, the, the registry system was there to help with cl clinical decision support. And for this baby, recommending some immunizations, and we don't know how tall this patient is. Had, they have been registering how the length of the baby or the height of their toddler. So, so please measure the height of this patient today so we can calculate a BMI. Okay. Um, but once the data are in there, then before every visit, they would print out an, they would print out a summary sheet or, or sheets of all the data that are all the relevant data. There was a subset that were used for primary care, a separate, different one for the ER, a different one for OB, for PEDS, but whatever. I mean, the, the, we, the provider designed what they wanted on those printouts, and then before every visit, this stuff would print out. And there were terminals available in the clinic where you could look stuff up too. Okay, um, so. Uh, the, the timeline is 1972 to 1974, developing the system. This was the whole system um, at that time. And then for three, for, for three years, that system was only used in the Reading Street Diabetes Clinic. So if you came into the Diabetes Clinic, you were registered in the system. And then the, the lab and pharmacy system were running in the background anyway, but that wasn't storing any information. It was spitting out results for, like, like they always did, but they wasn't storing those things in any longitudinal database because the patients weren't registered. So they registered patients at the Diabetes Clinic. And I saw seven patients a week, one half day a week, seven patients. And for three years, they, they, they perfected things in that one small clinic. And this is how implementation science goes. You start small, you perfect it, and, and then you go, you go large. And so, it went, and so this is how it all started. So this is the old Wishard Hospital, okay? And if you notice this building, this, this was the Reagan Street Health Center. This is 72 when this picture was taken. And in 74, that building was finished and it's sitting right over there. It's still there. It's where my office is in the School of Public Health, okay? Um, and it's where, um, uh, the Reagan Street Institute moved as well. It used to be in the old part of Wisher and it moved over there in 1974. In um, 77, they turned on this system for the Wisher General Medicine Clinic. And that's back when I was a second year resident. Um, so every patient came in, we, had, we used this, this, this system. Patients were registered and we did all the stuff that you saw earlier was now available to us. Um, and then in 79, the Wisher Special Medicine Clinics. And then in 83, pediatrics, OBGYN and, and and peds, and then in 1986, all of Wishard Health System was using CLEMS system, the Ring Street Medical Record System, to manage, to store and manage data for the entire network. Okay, so how did it work? Well, here's how it worked for so the patient checked in, went to the clerk, the clerk had a terminal in front of, of usually a her, and they used the ADT system to register the patients. So you know who they were, they knew, they knew they were, and where they were because it was in that particular clinic, I knew when because it was that date. Okay, then the patient waits. Okay, we have waiting rooms. Um, and then the medical attendant will check the vitals and enter, enter it on that encounter form that you saw. Um, the clinician, either a physician or advanced practice provider, a PA or, an, or a family nurse practitioner would then review the patient chart in, in the workroom. Um, and then after kind of re refreshing your notion of the, your, your knowledge of the patient, we'd go to, into the, uh, the patient exam room and talk to the patient. Um, take a history, 
review the paper chart. I, I would just open up and just um, let me go through the, the, the stuff in your chart that's relevant to our discussion today and um, or, or look it up when they ask a question about a previous lab or something. Do a physical exam um, and then discuss with the patient what, what you are going to do. Then the patient leaves the room, the clinician went back to the workroom and then wrote, hand wrote a note on that encounter form and orders, orders and filled up requisitions and he had to write a letter, he had to write a letter on, on stationary. Okay. Um, but the key is, is that it was a paper platform for documentation. And fast forward, and I'm not gonna talk much, uh, actually any about our program in Africa. When we started there, it was all in paper encounter forms. Um, and it's because it's cheap, it's portable, and we could do it. We get it started without having to have connectivity. There was no Wi-Fi in the country. There was, I mean, it was the only way we could actually get it done. So it was actually a paper record system with a, with a computer database, which is what Clem system was. So then the first thing he did, which was a landmark, was the, was the, the Regan's Reef Reminder Study. It was a randomized trial in a general medicine clinic. The, the, you saw the, the intervention on the encounter form. I'll show you in a second a different sheet that was also put on top of the chart as a reminder. The control just got the encounter forms and summaries without reminders. It was a two-year study. There were 100 and, uh, and some odd uh, resident physicians, uh, almost a dozen faculty and four nurse practitioners, and about 12,000 plus patients. Um, it was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 1984. Um, this is what the what this printed sheet looked like. Um, so the dot matrixy printers, you know, um, and uh, it was just put in the in the in the chart, and at the end of it, were just thrown away. Um, uh, et cetera. And this was the result, is that overall, the control physicians responded appropriately to the needed care 29% of the time. When they got reminded, it was 49% of the time. And you could see that the different interventions down here, occult blood for uh, fecal, uh, for colorectal cancer screening, uh, cervical smear for, for uh, cervical cancer. I mean, you can, you can read all these. There, there were 40, 1,400 different rules in CLEM system that generated these, these sets of, of reminders, okay? Then in 1986, Wishard kind of did an interesting thing is that, is that the system kind of connected to other clinics around the city, usually over telephone or T1 lines. Um, so well, they weren't really live, it was just a matter of being able, you could use those to look up data and the encounter forms were sent back to, to Wishard where they were hand entered into the system. But when you went there, when you practiced there, you could actually have an electronic medical record. You could look up stuff that happened to that patient anywhere within the Wishard Health System network, okay? Um, and some of these were th IU clinics, Wisher clinics, and a bunch of other clinics. Some are student clinics, and some are clinics run by other uh, organizations around Indianapolis. So this is one of the nation's first distributed EHR networks. You actually be away from the, 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 the central chart that's still accessing it. Um, and then we, but there was a problem with this, is that if you wanted to, if you wanted to affect decision making, you didn't get the data until after the patient was gone. You couldn't really affect care during that visit, depending on what was found during that visit. And Clem wanted to do that. And so he created the, the Reagan Street order entry system to, um, I, I should just, what I said, to, uh, to be able to capture the data in real time, getting them typing on computers. The, 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 the computers were now much less expensive. You know, a desktop computer only cost $2,500 back in 1988. Imagine how much that is in today's dollars. So they were actually still pretty expensive back then. Um, and the system looked like this, pretty straightforward, written in Windows 95. Um, and the, the, the different tests and treatments, et cetera, were all menu driven based, uh, based on this, whatever diagnosis, and then here is a primary reason for that particular visit, whether it's inpatient or outpatient. So with heart failure, that it would have all the, it would have suggested orders for heart failure, it would have prescriptions for heart failure, and the order they should be used and things you shouldn't use a lot either weren't on the menu or they were very near the bottom. Um, same with tests and other orders. And then on the second page was where you would write your note. Okay, pretty straight, simple and straightforward. And then we conducted a randomized controlled trial of this. Would, I won't go, if, if you want to talk about this sometime, about how to do a randomized controlled trial on an active inpatient service where the, the physicians are coming and going and being re-randomized at different teams all the time. It was, it was a trip, but this is the only randomized controlled trial of hospital-based CPOE ever done and ever will be done because now it's a required element of all EMRs and it was done here. Um, and what they showed was that the, the, the control teams were using the paper chart, right? And this is just a big, just, just a typical paper chart with paper that you write notes and orders on, okay? Um, that there was a 13% uh, or about a, 
nine hundred uh, dollar difference in overall. This is this is estimated cost. These aren't charges. If you're using the the, the the CMS cost to charge ratios. This is this is what the hospital's cost was for managing these patients. So it was about 13% less for the intervention group than the control group. And and it was the same for bed costs, test costs, drug costs, and other costs. And probably because there was an 11% or almost a full day reduction in the length of stay in the hospital. And you know why should it make a difference in length of stay? Well, I'll give you an example. So when when a patient came into the Wishart Emergency Room, and again I worked there for 25 years. Um, You'd examine the patient, you decided what you wanted to write in sort of orders and, and treatments, and then you take the encounter form and put it in a box. And it would sit there until the, the, you, the nurse working in that particular unit would come and take the stuff in the box and say, put the test orders over here to be taken to the lab, and then put the drug orders over here to be taken to the pharmacy, and the radiology ones over here to be taken x ray, and then they would call for the those. The, the lab would take the blood and run it. The x-ray would call the patient, have him sit down there. And the pharmacy would then process the, the order, pull the drugs out, put them in a box, and send the box to the, to the, to the um, ER where the, the nurses would then give the drugs to the patient. With the electronic record, they wrote the order, went to the pharmacy. The pharmacy filled and sent the drugs to the, to the, to the um, to the ER, when the drugs arrived, they gave them. The nurse might not even know they've been ordered yet, but they arrived and there was the information about how to give them. And so they, they verified the order and they gave it to the patient. The average length of time between checking into the emergency room and getting the first drug for the, with those who were using the paper record was six hours. The average length of time for the, those, those using electronic record system was 30 minutes. So there's a 12 fold reduction in the time it takes to get your patient treated. And it's been well shown that the time to treatment is a pretty good predictor of how well the patient's gonna do, especially with things like pneumonia, sepsis, et cetera. Okay, so the point is that, um, and, and, and with all of this, this is in, in Wishard Hospital. Of the 92 safety net health systems in the country, Wishard had the highest quality score and has the bottom quartile in costs. And, and there are a lot of reasons for that, but this was one of them because they relied on the information from this system. Okay, so, in 1988, this is what it looked like. This is actually the emergency room um, where people are using, you know, uh, Clem system. And then 25, 24 years later, this is Wishard Hospital. Same system written in Windows 95. For 25 years, the same system fiddled with, but still the same basic system was still being used. And this is a year before Wishard closed. And at that time, Wishard Hospital was 103 years old. It was the oldest hospital in the country. Yet it was, it, from an uh, electronic health record standpoint, it was, it was at the front of, of the curve. It was leading the curve. Um, so, so this is where you are now. This is the IU Medical Center campus. You're actually sitting right here. Um, uh, and this is Wishard Hospital. And right across the street is Riley Hospital. It was the only children's hospital in the state at the time. Um, so why would Wishard build a NICU? Because there aren't that many patients coming to Wishard in NICU, but some do. But Riley gets them from all over the state, so this got a big NICU. So why should why should Wishard build a NICU, a, a, you know, a neonatal intensive care unit? So if a patient came into Wishard and needed, needed neonatal patient care, the patient went to Riley. No information, everyone, or I shouldn't say none. Really, often the inf information didn't go with the patient when they went there. So they didn't know what happened while they were being treated at Wishard. This is IU Hospital, three, two blocks away. Wish was across the street. I mean, right across the street, right there. Um, uh, this is IU Hospital, two blocks away. They've got a cardiovascular surgery unit. They do a lot of cardiovascular surgery. It's the only university hospital in the state of Indiana. Why should Wishard build a cardiac surgery unit? Doesn't make any sense. So they sent their patients over there. They had arrived with no information. When they came back to Wishard, they come back with no information. Two blocks away. Literally have to call and say, so what happened to my patient when I sent them to you? And then they could tell you over the phone. And some of us worked in both places. I worked at IU Hospital. So if I was over there and I called one of my Wishard patients, I couldn't look up their record. So Clem asked for permission to be able to download patient data from their subsystems, lab, pharmacy, ADT, and create a registry medical record for, for the IU Medical Center campus, okay? And then over here was the VA hospital and they had the same thing. I was a VA physician as well, and I, same problem with that, and patients would come into the Wisher ER, need hospitalization, they'd been cared for at the VA, so they'd be sent to the VA, and they would often go there with that information. Or if they were kept at Wisher, you wouldn't know what happened at the VA previously to help you with care. 
So they connected to the, to the VA hospital. The ones to, to IU and, and Riley, there are tunnels underneath these buildings here. Most people don't know that. And they could run fiber optic cables through those, even easy to get. That didn't go that direction to the VA, so they had to dig a trench and lay fiber optic cable down in the trench. And for 20 years, that was the only way the VA hospital was connected to the internet. And about once every six months or so, some, and it was through the Wishard Clinical Lab was where it was plugged into the internet. And about once every six months, somebody would go up and say, what's this? And unplug the thing and the entire VA would go dark. So now they're, 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 they're connected to the, the, the fire rapid cable going along 10th Street here now. But, but still, you know, they had to actually dig a trench. Okay, you dug a trench. Um, so this, this, these are the three hospitals, which are in the middle, and then, and then IU Riley and the VA. And this was the country's first health information exchange back in 1988, 1989, okay? And then Clem spent a couple of years doing something that is absolutely remarkable, okay? He was able to convince the enemy to participate, and the Methodist Hospital was the enemy. We hated them, they hated us. We competed for everything because we, they, we were, Wisher was a down, the downtown down provider and, and they, they struggled all the patients, especially those with insurance and Medicare and stuff like that. They, they, so we, he convinced them that half the time when patients come into your ER, we got relevant data in our record that you wanna see. So we convinced them at Regan Street's cost to be able to, to connect them and create a Regan Street record for, for Methodist Hospital. And once Methodist was on board, then St. Vincent's, Community East and St. Francis wanted to be involved. And this became the Indiana Network for Patient Care back in 1995. These, these, it's gonna be seven hospitals if we count these plus, uh, you know, the, all the ones done on the, on the main campus here. Um, and, uh, and this is what the growth looks like. So this is, this is, you know, 95 is right here with these seven hospitals. Where is it? I can't get them at my house. These, these seven hospitals, that's not showing, okay. Is this one? Oh, never mind. These these seven hospitals there. Um, and then this was the went to the rapid growth phase of of health systems in the United States when they started buying up other hospitals, and by by you know the 2010 there were 40 hospitals that are part of these five hospital networks: Eskenazi, Ascension, this uh, community, uh, Franciscan, and um, uh, I'm looking at the other one. Oh, IU Health. Um, and then other hospitals, because of the needs, the demands by the federal government for, for hospitals to deliver, uh, deliver information about hospitalized patients to their primary care physicians, et cetera, the other hospitals want to be part of this network so that, that the INPC could do it for them. So the number of hospitals now has gone up tremendously, and they're all over the state of Indiana. Okay, and this is actually an old map because it doesn't show the ones around Fort Wayne, which are now finally on board. Um, so there are 123 hospitals and health systems uh, that are part of this, 19,000 uh, practices, 50,000 uh, clinicians, um, more than 19 million patients. And to put that into perspective, there's only six and a half million people in Indiana. So it's got people who've been, come and gone. It's got people in the, in the border states, et cetera. Um, and uh, it's got more than 16 billion separate observations. These are, these are, you know, these are the things in the database, separate things with a, a name, a term, a date and a result. Um, and Ring Street actually spun off a nonprofit corporation called the Indiana Health and Fresh Exchange to run all of this. Okay, so, so um, and these are the core data that, the, the, the top six things are the core data that if you're part of the INPC, you have to provide these things. And th there's some wiggle room on that, but they are ADT, clinical lab, microbiology, path, radiology, and other imaging studies, and, and transcriptions, notes. And, and then other organizations like IU Health and Ascension and Eskenazi provide a lot of cardiology data. Um, it also provides, um, Sh Sean left, but Sean helped create the system that provides the, the notifiable condition detector that provides reportable information to the state the health department. More than 90% of all the reports they get are from, this, from the INPC. And this is influenza-like illness from, from all the emergency rooms in the state of Indiana. Um, and this is this year, downloaded a week ago. Okay, so we, we had a surge post-COVID and now it's gone back down. But this is how the state of Indiana manages these things and how it managed COVID. So it took, once <clears throat> COVID hit in the early 2000s, it took less than a month to generate this, this dashboard, which the governor of the state of Indiana used to make critical conditions about the state of Indi about uh, how to deal with a pandemic. 
It was all evidence-based because the evidence came from here. Um, and then Brian, you know, wrote recently saying that, yeah, it can be used for chronic disease management too. That, um, you know, electronic health records are important, uh, I'm trying to read this, important for public health and not just for tracking infectious disease, but also chronic disease. Their data can allow us to go into smaller geographic areas, counties, even neighborhoods, so that we can better target interventions to address chronic illness in the country, in the county where it exists, okay? It's not just the public health stuff, it's management. Um, although I would argue they're not different. Um, so take a step back. So that's here, but what's happening nationally? Well, in, in the early aughts, there weren't a lot of electronic records being used in the country. About 20% or so of the hospitals were using electronic record. About 10% of physicians were using electronic record. Then as part of the era, you know, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, there was a thing called the High Tech Act, which which provided about $30 billion to bribe hospitals and physicians into using electronic records, knowing that you're gonna be penalized in a bit if you don't use them. Um, and because of that, this is how the growth went. Okay, so that by, you know, five years later, 75% of physicians and 97% of hospitals were using electronic records, approved electronic records. That's an amazing transformation and it sucked. And it sucks because the commercial systems out there were actually billing systems that were that were quickly evolved into what they call electronic records, but they're written for people who had no clinical knowledge and didn't know how how clinicians practiced. Um, and so they were they they were clunky, and I'll get into that a bit. But but they got out there at least, okay. And then, but then what about patients? Well, you know, then the patients provide these portals. And, and last week, these are the three portals that I, that I personally interacted with, all right? And there are actually two other health systems that I've got data in, you know, and, and this is kind of called hyperportalitis. So that I've got to know where the data I want are to be able to look for them. Why can't the patients access the INPC? And the answer is, I have the faintest idea why not, but they can't. There's been a decision to only allow the health system to access those data, not, not patients, and that makes no sense to me. Um, so but what are the problems with the, with the EHRs? Well, because they were, they were expensive. The, the, when, they, when they took the Reagan Street system out of Eskenazi and put in Epic in 2015, the cost of that, trans, trans, that conversion was $100 million. You're not hearing things, there's $100 million. Um, uh, they, they are, were incompletely developed, they were inflexible, they, they were, were built by non-clinicians, and they one-size-fits-all solutions when different practices and different health systems practice in different ways and want information in a different flow, you didn't have that kind of flexibility. So you had to build your health system around the record. Um, the, uh, uh, the, there was medical note bloat. So these are, this is a, uh, oops, sorry, this is a, number of characters per note in the United States in the middle and Europe on the left. That, that, you know, and it's because we require, the, the notice was used for billing, so if you want to be billed, you want to charge a lot, you got to put a lot of crap in the note. Um, and so, and, and then things like this, so th these are the top part of the nuclear medicine study of, a, of your tear duct, to see whether it's open on a kid, okay? And the answer was it's closed on one side. Okay, and the bottom is a, is, a, is a prostate cancer scan, and the answer is it's negative. But look at all those words. All of that goes into the record, and, and you know, you could look through that and take a while to figure out what, what the result is. It's not conducive to easy decision making. Okay, um, clinician burden and burnout, that they were being asked to do so much with clunky systems that was driving them crazy, and it was, it was the number one reason why people, why physician burnout and quit both before and during the pandemic. Um, and, and as a result, they cut and pasted notes. Instead of having to deal with this stuff, I can just cut the last note and add a little stuff at the bottom, which means the notes get longer and longer and longer and longer, and the stuff that was up above, which you don't read anymore, is no longer active. The, patient, you, the first note had a ventilator setting, the patient's not even in the ICU anymore, and yet they're in the ventilator settings. You have no idea what's going on with the patient. When I was the chief of medicine at Eskenazi, I had to read that, figure out whether or not, for every patient who died, I'd, I had to figure out whether I was expected death or not. I couldn't read the chart. And it was our chart. This was, the, this was our system that was in there. I couldn't read it because of cutting and pasting. I, had to, I actually looked at the nurse's notes and the labs because the only way I could figure things out. Um, 
alert and reminder fatigue, you know, because alerts work, they just keep using them. And I'll tell you what, about how that screws things up. And just, it just, they didn't make anything better. Before electronic health records, medical errors were the third leading causes of death in this country. Since we've had alert, uh, electronic medical records, medical errors are the third leading cause of death in this country. It hasn't changed. Um, examples, in one hospital, 15% of all drug orders uh, create a, a drug interaction alert. Um, 97% of the time they were ignored. Half the time they weren't ignored, they wrote the wrong order. Um, one hospital had three quarters of a million interruptive alerts in three months, and only 4% were valid. There were 1.3 million non-interruptive alert, uh, uh, non interruptive alerts, only 2%, 2.5% resulted in an action. Nurses enter data into flow sheets rather than how the patient is doing. Um, and there's click fatigue. Okay. Um, this is a, but, but it's not, this is a recent article that shows, well, sorry, this is, this article just, just shows essentially that, that, that using computers is the main reason why people get burnt out. I'm going to have to go a little bit more quickly here. 40% of it, 44% of the time spent on computers. Um, but the average physician spending two hours a day of pajama time at night dealing with their notes. And that's just unconscionable. Um, uh, I'm going to skip some of this stuff because we're getting a little bit late. This is an example of uh, you go into the exam room and somebody's on a computer. They're typing on the computer. They're not talking to you. And this is actually a video that Rich Frankel did over as part of one of his studies. And shortly after this, that woman fell off that table. Okay, and they were able to move it around so they so that they could see, the patient could see what the patient's typing. But this is ridiculous. Um, Wrong diagnoses persist in the ER. If I make a wrong diagnosis and I just made a mistake, it has to stay there forever. They can't delete it. Um, uh, and when the system goes down, nobody knows how to practice. When, when Eskenazi went down during the, um, uh, with the data getting stolen, the, the ransomware thing, it was, it was horrible. Um, and cutting and pasting notes make it unreasonable. Um, but this is an article came out last year showing that the time you spent on the, on the, on the computer was directly related to higher quality care, that you had better cancer screening care and better control of diabetes and hypertension. So there's something good happening in there too, and, and I think the systems are slowly improving. So potential solutions, enhanced institutional support and readiness. Have a, have a system for when it goes down. Um, and have clinicians, not geeks, but clinicians review the records and get rid of stupid stuff. Okay, second thing is state-of-the-art data entries tools. Use more voice recognition and AI, and we'll talk about that in a second. Like here, this is last week where Microsoft and, and OpenAI and using GPT-4 are creating, a, are testing now a system where it, it listens to the ambient talk within, a, within an encounter and it writes your note. Um, this came out, wait a second. Well, anyway, no, no single, I, this is what I think should happen. There should be no note. If everybody documents what they do and it's in the record, it's all there. If you want something that looks like a note, the computer should be able to pull all that stuff together and make it sound like a note or a letter to a referring doctor, or a work excuse, or a billing record. It's just put the data in that you're responsible for and let the record speak for itself. Um, this was an NPR this morning, okay? Um, and, 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 um, and, what, and what it essentially said was AI could be used not only for listening and writing a note, but also helping you decide what is the best kind of care for your patient. But again, it, it, what it said was it can do wrong stuff. The physician still has to be the, the physician and other clinicians have to be the ones in charge. Um, stop using, let clinicians be clinicians. Stop using the, the, the chart for billing. Stop it. Let the billing clerk do the billing. Don't, 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 don't make the physicians record that information. And minimize use of physician for any other kind of information gathering. Establishing, establish clinician committees to redesign the things so it serves their interests, um, uh, and measure the burden and and minimize it. Um, then finally, future directions: effective use of AI and ML, um, writing notes and extracting data from EHRs. If somebody comes in, you know, a new patient and you got a big chart, let it tell me what's wrong with the patient. Don't make me look through the chart. The technology for that is there today. Um, so it's little data, not big data, little data. Um, capture social risk data. The National uh, Academy of Medicine came out with this report in 2019 saying that you ought to be merging medical care and social care. Um, and so we should be capturing risk data on things like, uh, you know, and this is a good example. This is the neighborhood deprivation, the social deprivation index for Indianapolis. And the darker, redder places that are have more social deprivation, okay? This is Wishard Hospital's health equity zones. 
They've got clinics in these areas and the place where they're doing things to identify patients with needs, going out and reaching the community and trying to help them. If you look, there's almost exact overlap between the, the social deprivation data in these zones. Um, but we should be looking, we should be storing data on social determinants of health like their clinical data and referring people to, to rent support or to legal services or, or to uh, transportation help, um, the same way we refer people to a neurology clinic and get information back. Um, so capture, store, manage, and use social data the same as clinical data. So we start off with paper, you know, we ended up in, the, we, we got slammed into the digital era. We've had hiccups getting started, but the future is actually pretty bright if we can figure if the clinicians can be involved in, in, in using this medium, the medium in which clinicians work to serve their needs. Um, and with that, I'll end. Um, and you're asked to take a picture of that QPC code and do a survey. I got a brief time of questions. I have a plane to catch a three, so. Okay, well, thanks. This is, this is fun because I got a chance to revisit all this stuff, but it's um, uh, a lot's happened and a lot of it happened here. That's the important part of it.